All right, well, today I'm joined by Luke Runyon. We're going to talk about animal agriculture and the headlines and, and a journalist perspective. So this is rare that I get to actually interview a journalist, and Luke's going to do the same. And uh, I don't know if I feel comfortable with the questions being asked of me, because, Luke, I'm usually the one asking the questions, and you're probably... You're probably the same. It's always a little more uncomfortable being on the other side of the of the interview. Now so. we can relate to our uh, to our victims. I mean, the people that we interview <laughs> is what I mean. Um, so, Luke, I'll have you give a little bit of, of your background. But Luke is kind of representing um, what we call the mainstream uh, media this week and, and speaking on that perspective. But talk about who you who you work for and, and, and what area you cover. Yep. So my name is Luke Runyon. I work for a group called Harvest Public Media, and we're essentially a small network of public radio stations all throughout the Midwest and the Great Plains. Um, I'm based in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm the furthest west in Harvest. Uh, we have reporters in Kansas, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois. I always miss one. Um, but essentially, we, we report on food and agriculture feature stories, radio length, about four to five minutes, and then we share all of that content among all of the partner stations within Harvest. Every now and then we'll do national stories for NPR, and those kind of get strung up the line uh, to the network. Um, but solely focused on food and agriculture, and lately more rural issues. Um, I originally grew up in Illinois, in central Illinois. Both of my parents grew up on farms. Um, those are still in the family. One just turned 100 the other day. Um, so I have a personal background in agriculture, be, spending all of those days going to grandma and grandpa's farm. Um, now I have a professional focus, exploring some issues in agriculture. So Luke, like the NPR route, is that something you always wanted to do? Kind of what piqued your interest or sparked your interest and in, in, in made you take that route? I had that cliche uh, public radio experience where I grew up in the back seat of my parents' car. They were devout public radio listeners. Um, and maybe even in utero, being exposed <laughs> to public radio. Um, so it was always something that was kind of in the back of my mind. And when I knew that I wanted to go into journalism, um, public radio was a great avenue because it gives you a lot of freedom as a reporter. It's very rare that you find a um, broadcast medium that allows you flexibility in the length of stories. I mean, a five-minute story on something related to agriculture is unheard of in a lot of other broadcast media. In public radio, they give you the freedom in order to do that. So it was, a, it was attractive. My background was a, a little bit different. Um, you know, I started uh, broadcasting on the radio when I was, I was 16. I got a, a, a asked out of the blue if I wanted to be a local farm broadcaster. I'm 16, I mean, I grew up, you know, in and around agriculture, but I didn't know a thing about the farm markets, and so in three days, I learned how to read the agricultural markets and the CME um, off of my DTN screen uh, in three days, and then that next day, they, they put me on the radio, so kind of thrown into the fire. But that's when I realized that um, ag communications and ag journalism was really what I, what I wanted to do. So I went to the University of Missouri, majored in agricultural journalism with an emphasis in broadcast. You can't get more niche than that. You know, <laughs> being in the broadcast school, I think people thought that, that I was a little bit crazy, that agriculture is really wanted, what I wanted to report on. But I was able to kind of make that beat uh, whenever I reported for the local NBC affiliates. Um, but my senior year, I did a two-part series on confined animal feeding operations. Um, and I interviewed uh, who is now the Missouri Director of Agriculture, Chris Chin, uh, and we talked about the positives of confined animal feeding operations um, from, you know, the number of employees and just the economic benefits that these confined animal feeding operations uh, provided to local communities. And at the time, uh, you know, I didn't really get the, the ones that, that were against the confined animal feeding operations because there were so many negative stories out there at the time. Uh, that's when Arrow Rock was going through um, and, and, and talking about putting some of those operations in, and there was tons of, of negative uh, stories in the media. So I decided to do a positive story. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty one-sided. Um, so then we did a two-part series. After the first story, we got tons of calls and emails um, into that local NBC affiliate talking about how poor the story was. At the same time, we got tons of calls and emails into the studio and the station uh, from people in agriculture saying, thank you for finally sharing agriculture's voice. 
Um, it was then that I was called into the news director's office and told, Tyne, your story had too many uh, negative comments, but more importantly, it had too many positive comments. And that's when I realized, you know, maybe I was too passionate to report on agriculture uh, locally. And I really did not want to report for a local TV station where I, not, I didn't get to always talk about agriculture. So I would have to talk about uh, suicides and, you know, car accidents and, and become very jaded in that sense. So I got out of broadcast altogether and kind of wrote it off after I graduated college and thought, once I get into the PR field, I will never make my way back in. Because it's very hard once you leave to get back into uh, to, to, to journalism. Uh, but long story short, uh, sometimes it's not all about your timing and your plan. And I got a call out of the blue one day after I moved to northern Indiana, offered a job with the uh, Ag Day and U.S. Farm Report as the reporter. A couple years later, um, then I, I got offered the, the job as, as host of U.S. Farm Report. So this was not in the plan. I mean, this was my dream job, but this wasn't in the plan. Um, but I realized quickly, Luke, that someone that grew up in and around agriculture, I was really really passionate about this industry and I knew that I wouldn't be able to cover the stories that I wanted to in a local media. So now I feel like I have the best of both worlds because I can cover agriculture and talk about it at a level that most of our farmers and ranchers you know, understand and really get into a deep dive um, of, of the issues impacting agriculture today. I think I came to realize that being a kid going to grandma and grandpa's farm and living in a city, I really didn't know a whole lot about agriculture actually <laughs> until I started doing those deeper dives and got to learn a lot more. It was a crash course. Leading up to the election, the coverage uh, from, from media, I mean from mainstream media, from ag media, I mean it was definitely interesting and, and to see some of the different routes that some of the journalists took. Uh, but it was the night of the election that I was watching the coverage. Um, I was actually at a milk conference in Las Vegas uh, with dairy farmers. So while Las Vegas was depressed with the outcome of the election, uh, we got a call from uh, milk producers who were celebrating at Trump Tower, right? Very, very different uh, outlooks on the election. But it was that night watching the coverage, and I think I remember um, Chuck Todd, as they see the election results come in and they realize uh, that, that President Trump was, was actually going to win this thing, uh, he made the comment, he said, we've forgotten about rural America. Rural America wants their voice heard. And if we've learned one thing tonight, we've forgotten about rural America. And for us as an ag journalist, you know, it was, it was refreshing that, that they were actually taking notice that rural America has this very loud voice out there. And maybe they aren't the loudest, but they're kind of the silent majority oftentimes. And then it was interesting to see some of uh, my peers get called from national media to then be interviewed by some of these national media because they finally wanted to hear what rural America had to say, what rural America wanted, uh, you know, what it wanted to get across, what message they had. So Luke, from your perspective, I mean, you cover, that's your beat, rural America and, and, and food and, and, and stuff, that, that is your beat. So NPR, did they change? I mean, did they rely more on you to cover more stories and broadcast those uh, over all of your affiliates after, after the election? Did you feel like the tone changed? A little bit. Um, so prior to the election, NPR was doing a series of stories called A Nation Engaged, which were essentially voter profiles from across the country. Um, I did the rural voice. So NPR approached me, said, we want to have a, a rural voter perspective. Um, so I think in maybe September or October, uh, contacted a female farmer in eastern Colorado, went out and chatted with her, and I was s listening to her. She was saying a lot of the things that we were hearing post-election. She was saying, this whole campaign, I've felt neglected, nobody's talking about rural issues, I feel like they're really important, um, and I feel like, she said, both candidates aren't really um, talking to rural issues. But I'm, I'm one vote, just like everybody else, um, and so I'm going to go out to the polls and do my part. Um, and after the election, you started getting this intense focus on rural issues. You've got all these national media outlets that are saying, we need to have more reporters in rural areas, we need to be exploring these topics. That was maybe a drumbeat for two months after the election, and it's not necessarily, you know, I don't see the Washington Post opening a Kansas City bureau. Um, <laughs> or even more rural, you know, in the middle of Missouri. I don't see that happening anytime soon. So I think it was a month of self-reflection and then uh, move on after that. I but agree. Harvest is still here. We're still reporting on rural America, but a lot of national media outlets 
didn't quite take that next step in order to make it uh, to follow through with that. So it's kind of faded nationally, but you feel like NPR, I mean, with, with Harvest Media, you, there's still a large focus uh, on, on rural America. Yeah, we, when we were first established, we were set up to report solely on food and agriculture. And by doing that, you end up reporting on a lot of rural issues. That's where agriculture is done. Um, but we weren't necessarily focused on the broad umbrella of what it means to live in a rural area, or what it means to be a person who lives in a rural area, or what is a rural community, what do the people care about. And we've changed that tone um, since, since the election. We have moved more into stories about ruralness and not just food and agriculture. And it's yielded a lot of really fascinating stories that were right under our nose that we didn't necessarily focus on because it didn't have that traditional food and ag hook. Um, you know, going to a meatpacking town, um, there's a few in Colorado, Greeley, Colorado is one, Fort Morgan, Colorado is another. These are fascinating places that are really melting pots. You know, you look at the, just the demographics of these certain towns, they are um, at least Fort Morgan's predominantly Somali, Latino. Um, Fort Morgan's high school is 70% non-white, um, and it's in the middle of rural America. And it's anchored by a meatpacking plant. It's why it is the way that it is. But nobody was really telling the story of the place. You'd go there if there was a dispute at the meatpacking plant or an accident. Um, now, I feel like we've changed our focus to, let's go there just because it's an interesting place and see what we come up with. Who's your audience, mainly? I mean, when you look at, at, at some of the, 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 the um, biggest listenership that you have, what areas and kind of what demographics would you say is, is your main audience? The public radio audience is more educated than uh, other media outlets. They tend to have higher incomes. Um, they, even though a lot of people consider public radio a more liberal, uh, pushing some sort of liberal agenda. Our, uh, you look at a partisan split of our listenership, you end up with roughly equal percentages of registered Democrats, registered Republicans, and people who are unaffiliated or independent. Um, so it, it tends to be, a, a, you know, who you think of as a public radio listener is probably pretty accurate. Um, they tend to be 45 to 65, that's our core um, listenership and usually have a college degree or higher. We're going to open it up for questions, so we'll be thinking about those. Uh, but the biggest complaint, you know, I've heard uh, from, from from many folks is that there's just this even greater divide within the media now. You know, that the, the, the media that's on the far right is get, getting even uh, uh, more on that right and the ones on the left are even getting more so that way. As a journalist, do you feel that way? I consume a lot of news. It's what I do almost every single day. Um, go into work and it's just a steady stream, fire hose, as soon as I sit down at my computer, because you want to know what's going on. And I do feel like you have seen that split. You've seen the quote unquote right wing media become more and more conservative, and you've seen the left wing media become more and more. And you do have a few players in the middle who try to do really fair coverage, and obviously, I'm a little biased towards public radio, I think we do a fairly good job, um, and our surveys say something similar, that we tend to approach issues with a pretty clear mind, clear-eyed, um, and try to do the fairest job that we possibly can. Um, so. Um, questions, are you, you're, our, you're our guy. Uh, so I was recently right back there. I was recently at the University of Missouri. Uh, they had me come back and be professor for a day uh, in ag econ. They definitely didn't look at my transcripts. Uh, but I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, I, I look. I uh, talk ag marketing on a daily basis with marketers. But um, so I go back and there's. I was speaking to an ag econ class, and one of the individuals in that class was a, a journalism major. Turns out her dad uh, teaches in the ag econ department, but she's a journalism major. So I had some similar questions from students, um, and then in, in talking about journalists uh, removing the, kind of that bias and really just reporting on facts. And she told me uh, that now what's being taught in the University of Missouri in the journalism school, which is, which is one of the, the, the best, so I, I like to believe, uh, that they're being taught now that it's unfair to think that journalists aren't going to have a bias. They're humans. Just like everyone else, journalists are humans. And so if you do have a bias or you have a tie to a story, that you're being taught now to state that bias 
before you even report on that story. So state it up front uh, before that 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 before your 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 report uh, um, goes live uh, out to your out to your audience. And I looked at and I laughed. Like I honestly laughed and I said, "You're kidding, right?" And she said she was actually really offended that I would laugh at this. Uh, and she said, "No, that's what we're being ta taught. It is not fair to think that I don't have an opinion or I don't uh, have a bias." And I told her, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's fair, but for generations, uh, reporters have done a good job of reporting on just the facts. And by you stating your bias up front, you are now a part of that story. And as journalists, I don't think that we should be a part of that story, right? We're there, we have the megaphone, we're there to, to state the facts, and we're kind of that medium that, that, that shares that story. But we shouldn't be a part of the story. And by you stating your bias up front, uh, you've become a part of the story. And she didn't agree with that, and that's fine, but that's what she's being taught today. Uh, and that, so that was disheartening for me as a journalist to realize that journalists are being taught that, to state their bias up front. Do I have an opinion? Yes, I do. But I'm a journalist. If I want to state my opinion, I'll get into the commentary field, right? Uh -huh. I need to become a, a, a commentator and not, not a journalist. Kind of what's, what's your thought on that when you hear that that's what's being taught um, in, in schools? I think it, it can be done. It's a, it's, sometimes it's a stylistic choice. So one of my editors will sometimes say, make sure you're always getting your reactions to things. When you're out in the field interviewing someone, say you're at a farm and a farmer tells you something really surprising that you did not expect. And my instinct is just to say, what? Or what are you talking about? Or like, that's crazy. Get that on tape because if I think something is surprising or unusual or unexpected, then the audience is probably going to think roughly the same thing, um, especially if they've never been to a farm, if they've never been to a ranch. Um, a quick example, I uh, did a very soft feature story on this abbey that's just uh, north of Fort Collins, Colorado. It's right on the Wyoming border. It's a beef cattle ranch that's run by about 25 nuns. And uh, they, see, it's surprising already. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Heavenly Beef. I thought Holy, really? Holy Cow would have been a better Holy name, cow. but <laughs> they didn't take that advice. Did they find it funny? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. um, they're, they're a pretty hip Abby, I have to, I have to say. Um, but one thing in the process of reporting that story that I didn't realize until I got there, they employ guard llamas to keep the calves safe, um, which I had never heard of before. Right? It's crazy. Llamas? Llamas. So if you, apparently if you raise a llama by itself, it turns into a really territorial sort of beast. They've seen them chase mountain lions and bears off of the property. Yeah, I know. Crazy. I think I'm, I think I'm going to get a llama for my house. <laughs> So when I was interviewing these sisters and they brought up the guard llamas and started telling me about it, I was reacting in that same way, like, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is crazy. And that ended up becoming, that was included in the story because it was just a funny moment of levity. Um, and yes, it injected part of me into the story, but I think it made it more compelling in the end. But you didn't tell your opinion. I mean, you were just giving an honest reaction. Right, like and my opinion the... was like, this is crazy. <laughs> you're, you're, you're using a series of guard llamas. They called them the thugs. <laughs> yeah, it was just great. This story getting better and better. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to go Google this <laughs> after I get done to, to listen to the story. So I can see that. I mean, if you're going to position it yourself. But, but I feel like as a journalist, we shouldn't be, I mean, you can be part of the story that way, but we shouldn't be making headlines ourselves. I right. mean, we should be helping tell the story. Uh, not being part of it in, a, in, in that way. Exactly, yeah. And before we take questions, I'm really curious about the room. Um, I would I'd love to see a show of hands of people who've been interviewed by a member of the media in the past. Who would classify those as good experiences? Okay, all right, that's more than I expected. And How is, many, that, well, is that mainstream media or is that like trade? Uh -huh. Media, more like ag media. Yeah. <laughs> We're Rally points. <laughs> and then, how many people would? Oh, she got interviewed by Harvest. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Was it me? <laughs> um, and then, how many people would would classify those as poor or bad? Ex who's had like a bad experience with the media? In the back, she was pretty persistent too. In the very back. <laughs> She immediately put her hand up. Okay. 
Well, I'd love to take questions, but I also love to hear that story at some point. She's like, oh, I'll tell it. Okay, so quick question. Knowing that Harvest Public Media has an investigative journalism section and you guys deal with controversial issues, what is your greatest challenge to get a balanced story? And what do you need to get the information you need to have more balance? I would say in terms of doing investigative work, we tend to focus a lot more on larger companies. And a lot of times, larger companies don't see a benefit in working with the media, um, especially if they're not a consumer-facing brand. Um, so in Greeley, we end up dealing a lot with uh, JBS. We also have Cargill that's just right down the road. I end up writing about all those two companies. And I would say that they have They've changed in the past to become a little bit more transparent. They'll actually like answer an email, which is nice. Um, but a lot of times, uh, you, don't, you don't hear from them. It's radio silence until there's a crisis, or there's an emergency, or they have something really great that they want to tell you about. Um, there's not, but, but at that point, you don't have a relationship with the people at that particular company and uh, you end up with a sort of antagonistic relationship right out of the gate. Um, if, so I would say the, the biggest thing is transparency. You have a lot of large players in the meat processing industry that haven't necessarily believed that they should be open and transparent with media. And I get it. I get. I was just going to ask, do you understand that? I though, get it. From that, a... <laughs> that the cost-benefit ratio is... There's no benefit in, t in doing that, especially if you're not a consumer-facing brand like JBS or Cargill. Like you're not going to the grocery store, you never pick up a package of JBS beef. Um, so I get why you wouldn't necessarily want to be inviting media in to come see the gory details of what goes on inside of a, a meat processing facility. Um, but it's important. And like we heard from the consumers uh, on the panel earlier, more and more people are curious about it. Some people want to know the gory details. They want to know what goes on um, on farms and ranches in meat processing. Um, so I would just in encourage more of an open dialogue. When someone's de declining, do you automatically assume that they have something to hide? Or do you, I mean, you, you understand uh, why they don't want to talk? I try to give it an open mind, um, but I'm going to be persistent. If there's, you know, at a certain point, you know, if, if we have something, latest example, we did a, a series of stories last year about worker safety in meatpacking facilities, looking at uh, fatalities, also looking at uh, repetitive injuries. That's something that JBS did not necessarily want to want to trot out um, and, and really talk about, but it's an, an important issue. And so it took a lot of negotiation between myself and the company in order to get to a point where they were willing to sit down for a recorded interview. <laughs> um, and part of it was just persistence um, and having a, a relationship prior to doing those stories. I had covered them for three years prior to doing that investigation, and so I knew some of the people who I was going to be interviewing before that happened. And that was the key difference. <laughs> so. I live in the Kansas City area. I listen to the public radio station and catch pretty much all of your pieces. And I often go to the transcripts as well because you've been in facilities where I've worked and you've been in facilities with people that I currently work with. Mm -hmm. And the pieces, I think, are for the most part quite balanced and pretty well researched. Um, but what always kind of gets me is the headline or the lead-in that's often associated with it to me is where the bias lies. And so it always, not always, my bad, it often carries the connotation of, you know, big, bad, you name it, meat packer, feedlot, uh -huh. confinement facility, kind of the whole, you know, big is bad, small is good and local. Um, I, I feel like even though the pieces are balanced, that the presentation of them at the top line level is not, mm -hmm. if I may be so bold to put you on the spot for that. <laughs> so I guess my, to, to, rather than put you on the spot, my question is like, who decides those lead-ins? Is that sort of out of your hands as the reporter? And what can we do to make those things more balanced 
to somebody that isn't going to listen to the whole piece or read the transcript. Good question. Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Some, I write all of the intros to my stories. So that, that piece that you're talking about, it's usually like three or four lines. And in broadcasting, what the bias is towards is towards tension. So you want to find where's the tension point in this story. That's what makes it compelling. And so in those three lines, you end up focusing on the conflict. Um, and a lot of times in this, it's animal rights activists are angry that such and such is happening. Or um, so you end up, you, you lay out the, the tension in those first three lines. I would say, uh, especially if you're doing a story for NPR, sometimes a host will rewrite your whole intro. Um, so your piece is already pre-produced, it's, it's recorded, it's done, it's been shipped off to the network. And then I'll sit down and listen to the story and I'll be like, they completely rewrote that. <laughs> um, and so it ends up being a surprise to me too. Uh, I, I don't have a specific example of that happening, but it has happened t to me before. Um, and that's pretty much completely out of my hands. I can send a nasty email after it happens, but um, there's no saying that that might not happen again. Can, can I ask a question about managing resources? I'm right here, by the way. <clears throat> I've, I've sat on your side of the table for a while, and and I, you know I've, I've tried contacting local resources, you know, people at, at major companies, and got completely stonewalled. You know, we we don't fool with you guys, no. And then they have a crisis, and all of a sudden they want to be my best friend. Um, how how do you how do you manage that? How how do you hold hands with those guys and and, and women? And you know, how how does it work for you? You mean like building relationships with those people before? Yeah, especially the ones that really don't want a relationship until things go sour. You know, <laughs> um, I've had I've had experiences where it's been as simple as like, let's go get a beer. I know that at a certain point, I'm going to need to talk to the PR person for this particular company. Let's go have a beer. I'm taking my reporter hat off. You're taking your PR person hat off. Let's just go actually sit down and talk and get to know each other a little bit. And I can show you that I'm not a scary member of the media. Um, and that's worked. Sometimes it's just persistence. Um, like I said before, it's, it's, I had one person who really didn't want to talk and I sent him an email every day and called him and left him a voicemail every day. And I said, I'm going to do this until you actually respond to me. Um, and it, you know, that takes a little effort. I had to set a reminder every day, like send him an email <laughs> um, and pester him until he will finally talk to you. And it worked. He eventually responded and was like, ah, you wore me down, I'll talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it does take, you know, you've got to allot the time, you've got to allot the brain space to do that. Um, and it's, yeah, not everyone wants to, not everyone wants to talk to you. I can't get McDonald's or Kroger's to respond to me uh, about the movement towards cage free, and so I'm going to write that down. <laughs> send a reminder every morning if I have time. I'm going to send a send an email or uh, make a phone call and kill them with kindness because every email was like, "Hope you're having a great day." <laughs> <laughs> and in reality, what did you yeah. want to say? <laughs> <laughs> Not that. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Janet Riley with North American Meat Institute. Hey, Janet. Hey, good to see you. I have a, I have a little bit of a pet peeve because I'm one of those dinosaurs, the last class at Northwestern that used a manual typewriter to get my journalism degree. And so I might be thinking way back in the old days, but I'd really appreciate your comment on a big pet peeve of mine. And that is the use of the term big meat to refer to the entire meat industry. Because if I'm big meat, then HSUS is like gigantic activism because you know, we have a far smaller budget, and yet I don't see those kind of pejorative terms applied to activist groups and others. And I've tried to reach out to editors of AP and elsewhere to raise my complaint. It's not in the style book, and I can't get anywhere. I'd be curious for your opinion. Hmm. Big meat. I don't think we have used that term in stories. Um, and actually, I've, I've done some stories you know, this phrase of like, big isn't bad. Um, I had a story with Temple Grandin. She's kind of a rock star in this world. Um, sat down and, and chatted with her about that exact topic. You know, like if Temple Grandin says it, then I think a lot of people will listen maybe. And she, 
laid out. Like, I don't think big is bad. I think that there, and I would say the same thing from operations that I've gone to. I've been to really large operations that I think are doing a really great job, and I've been to really small ones that are not doing a great job, and vice versa. Um, so it is kind of a misnomer. Like, it doesn't have a whole lot of teeth to it. But you do have really large companies that are in that space um, that most likely need to be held accountable. And Mm -hmm. Yep. Sure. Yeah, and I think that that's probably true. Do you have any advice for her? I mean, as a as a journalist that uh, reports like a, you know more in the mainstream uh, sector. Do you have any advice for her to kind of combat that and to get uh, some of those journalists to stop using that term? I would say it sounds like more you're curious about like pitching stories about the animal activist side. No? As big meat or big ag or big in general, like lump it all together yeah. versus talk about the specific company yeah. or the specific sector. Yeah, name them. I think it's sh it's shorthand for a lot of people, um, and I don't I don't put it in stories, but I will use it when I'm just you know thinking of a story idea, and it's not just big meat. I'll talk about big organic, um, you know. I'll talk about and and it's it's shorthand it makes it easier for people to understand um it makes it easier for my for my editor to understand what i'm talking about you know you, oh my god trying to pitch a national story about food and agriculture every editor that i work with is on a coast and a lot of them have never been to a farm and so in order to pitch something that i know that they're going to take you got to speak their language a little bit and then in the course of doing the story you can maybe talk talk them down from certain ideas that they might have or certain misconceptions. But to get your foot in the door, you got to you got to talk talk a little bit. But are those stories clicked on more? Like if you you would use the term big organic or big ag or one of those, I mean, have you guys found that those stories are, are, are clicked on and, and listened to more often? I don't think we necessarily do it. We don't we don't use those terms as much. Um, I bet we would. Um, <laughs> Thankfully, in nonprofit media, we're not always chasing clicks, so you know that's a little so bit sure. of a buffer, yeah. which is nice. You know, we're not always doing we're not doing clickbait. Um, we get our donations from our members and from underwriters, not from uh, traffic statistics that we can shop to advertisers. Hi, my name is Molly Zentz, and I do public. I'm right here. <laughs> Hi, um, I do public relations for the Indiana Farm Bureau. And I am three weeks into the job and brand new to agriculture and farming. Oh, wow. So this has been really, really educational for me. Um, not new to public relations, but I've been tasked with doing some media training for our farming members. That's one of the biggest things that I'm working on is helping them tell their story. So what would you recommend, even just as far as media training goes, what would be your biggest recommendations for me going out and speaking to our farmers about working with reporters? Thank you. I would say my, my biggest piece of advice, because I end up talking to a lot of trade associations looking for the real person, quote unquote. So a lot of editors will say, like, you want to you wanna do a story about the beef industry? You need to have a rancher in it. Um, and so a lot of times when I'm approaching a trade association, it's to say, like, hey, do you have anybody who has an operation kind of like this? So I would say, just start by creating a Rolodex of, of producers who you know are going to be able to talk to media, who are comfortable doing it, are willing to do it, um, who answer their cell phones, uh, <laughs> who have a cell phone. Um, so I, I would say that's the biggest piece of advice, because I'm guessing those are going to be a lot of the calls that you get from reporters who call up and say, like, I'm frantically looking for a farmer. Please, can you hook me up with anybody, please? Um, I end up making a lot of those types of phone calls. Not as much now that I've been on the beat for almost five years. I feel like I know who I'm going to get when I call the Colorado Farm Bureau, yeah. and I've talked to them a, a bunch of times. Um, but that would be my biggest piece of advice. 
And my piece of advice, I mean, I interview farmers and ranchers daily. I mean, that's that's my audience. I mean, I'm covering uh, ag and, and, and rural issues. My biggest thing is just um, don't say no. I mean, I don't know how many times I'll call someone, and it's like I'm having to sell myself. It's why I should come to their farm and do an interview instead of them saying, you know what, this is important. Let's talk about it. That's the, that's the biggest thing. And I think the mentality, and, and all of us in agriculture, I think, are under this, that sometimes uh, we think that not saying anything at all will go farther than, than, than actually commenting. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, and, I, and I understand that there's some distrust within the media and even with ag media, but it's just frustrating from my perspective. I mean, it's not like I'm against farmers and ranchers. That's my audience. That's who I, I get accused of advocating for on a regular basis, you know. And I still have difficulty sometimes getting, getting farmers to, to talk. And so, uh, you know, and we're a small staff, and that's what I was going to ask um, Luke about, you know. Uh, for a national show, I mean, we have, we have 500,000 viewers a week. I write the show and I host the show. I don't have any help. I don't have a managing editor. I don't have, I mean, I have a reporter that sometimes will do stories, but most of the time it's me going out and covering a story too. I mean, and so we were on such a small staff and I'm on such a tight timeline that oftentimes if I get someone that says no, then that, I mean, I'm not even going to be able to do that story that week, you know? Um, and, and I have someone that, that um, edits the show, but for a, for a show of our size, it's, a, it's, a, it's two team members. That's it. And we're also putting it online and doing that as well. Um, so I'm interested in Luke's perspective. I mean, how many do you, how many reporters, how many do you have on, on producing um, your, your program? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, one editor and we have currently four reporters, but we're hiring a reporter in Illinois right now. So we usually have five reporters who are working on that. And, and how many stations? Uh, gosh, like a dozen probably. Um, that cover a, a pretty broad swath right. of territory. Right. Um, and we're not necessarily, what's nice is that we have the luxury of taking a deeper dive in stories. And if somebody doesn't call me back one day, I don't kill the story. I follow up and say, okay, well, could you meet next week or two weeks from now? I'm always juggling like four to five stories at any given time, um, all of which are at different stages of completion. Um, get, you get one voice for this story, another voice for this story, and at a certain point you say, okay, I've got enough, I can actually produce it. Um, but that's the luxury that I have as a reporter is being able to give those stories time to percolate and, uh, and turn into something really compelling. Good afternoon. Uh, I have a question. Tim Rash from Lando Lakes. Have either of you covered uh, undercover animal activist video and your perspective and advice for the company that it's happened to and the producer that it's happened to? I, I can start off. I mean, we, we do, but from a different perspective. I mean, our focus on covering this is uh, farmers and ranchers need to know when something, when something like this happens because it is going to blow up in the national media and the mainstream media um, as well. So, so we cover it. But the most effective that I've seen um, as of late is the ones that immediately address it, right? They come out immediately with a statement that says, you know, um, we're, uh, we're, we're extremely disappoint disappointed that this one employee um, has, has committed this act, uh, that they have been terminated, you know, and, and kind of, an, and then it kind of uh, comes out later that it's an animal activist. And I know that then it's kind of buried because we've already covered it and, and that lead has already happened. Um, and you don't know until down the road kind of their background and what they were meant to do. But whether it's an animal activist or just an employee that's mishandled an, an animal, I think the ones that immediately come out address the issue, I mean, head on and say, you know, they, they've been terminated uh, as, a, as a company and as, as, as a family-owned business. You know, we don't, we don't stand for that. That has been the most effective. And that's changed. I mean, when we first started seeing some of these uh, undercover videos come out, it was like they shied away. They didn't want to say anything um, um, largely. And now it's like we're going to hit this head on from the beginning. And that has been the most effective in that tone uh, as helped as reporters. We have something to talk about and to combat that with because there's always another side to the story. Yeah, I, I, for a specific example, there was a, a dairy farm that was affiliated with Dairy Farmers of America outside of Fort Morgan, Colorado, that had, um, that had footage that was taken on site of employees kicking cows, using a screwdriver to stab cows. And uh, before those videos were released, I had a press release from DFA in my inbox. They had gotten word that they were gonna be released and DFA sent press releases out saying, we know this is coming, 
Um, we have seen the videos. We're taking actions. Um, we're sending auditors out to the farm. The employees in the videos have been fired. Um, and that, I think, probably blunted some of the blowback. Yeah. Um, they, it wasn't that you had all of the TV stations in Denver chasing this story, going, driving up to Fort Morgan to cover this. They were like, oh, well, you know, they still covered it. It was still a story. But I think it maybe had a shorter tail. Um, it wasn't in the news cycle nearly as much as it was. Agreed. Crisis management, right? I mean, if you're in, the, if you're in public relations, you go over this daily. Yeah. And I am in public relations. <laughs> um, so as a PR flack, hearing you talk about um, pitching to mainstream media, what advice can you give us to tell our side of the story to a media that wants the tension and likes the conflict that drives us crazy? <laughs> um, what can we do to interest them in the really interesting, fascinating stories that are going on in our industry, especially that mainstream media that you're dealing with? I would say do your homework. So if you're pitching a story, pitch it to a specific reporter who you know has an interest or has reported on this in the past. Um, look them up and see what they've written about. And then tailor your pitch to that person. Um, I cannot tell you how many press releases I delete every single day. Uh, just, you know, select all, delete. Um, because they're forms. They're not personal. They, they, they don't speak to me. They're not even really what I cover generally. Um, but the best pitches are the ones that are short, uh, you know, a paragraph, and really distill down, like, this is what we think is going on. This is the most important thing. Here's a person that you can talk to. Here's their phone number. Um, here's their email address. If you have all of that in a pitch, it is a lot harder for a reporter to say no. They'll, they'll most, they're more likely to respond to you, at least, even if they say no. There's still times where I'll get a pitch that has all of that in it, and it's like, oh, that's good, but I'm not going to have the time or the bandwidth or, or whatever to cover it. Um, but I'll, at least with those pitches, I'll respond. And I'll say, mm, can't get it to it, can't get it to it this time. But if you, you know, keep me around, like let me know what's going on in the future. I'd love to hear about it. Um, it makes all the difference to just have that little personal touch. Okay, last question. I think there's one in the back. Hi, Angie Grieving. Um, I do have a question about pitching and how social media has changed that aspect. So, are you looking more to social media engagements to have that one-on-one? -on -one? Um, or has it not changed anything at all? So you mean, I'm sorry, so pitching, pitching toward social media engagement, meaning like? Pitching stories to you specifically or, or within the industry. Has social media changed the interaction that you have? Are you, are you finding stories more in social? Yeah. Um, and having that engagement, does that help um, get that story out there? Totally. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've gotten story ideas from Twitter, from Reddit, from uh, Facebook. Um, sometimes it's just like an interesting Facebook comment that you follow up on, and it turns into something really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, it's definitely changed that aspect of it. It's a lot easier to find sources. I have a, a Twitter yeah, list true. of just farmers in Colorado who tend to tweet a lot. Um, and I'll check in with that column pretty frequently, um, and I'm always adding to it. So people who, who, you know, would probably fly under the radar of most other media outlets, they're, they're having a conversation, they're talking to one another, and I like, I just like to eavesdrop. <laughs> so I'll go in and see what they're talking about, see what the issues are, lob a question out, and see who answers. It's been extremely helpful in that sense. Luke, thank you. So when they, they wanted to do a panel on mainstream media, not a lot of them uh, wanted to come and, and, and speak to this group. So I think we owe Luke a round of applause for speaking to, uh, to a group about mainstream media. And really, uh, I know you thought you were going to defend uh, the mainstream media, but I mean, I think it's been very enlightening for most of us today to kind of hear your mindset and just daily uh, what you look for. So let's give Luke a, a round of applause.